I go now to chapter four. Everything what I told you last time and, and before about the behavior of the excitable tissues was below the threshold, sub-threshold phenomena. So it was passive, passive response of the axon to electric uh, stimulation. Now I go above the threshold so that uh, the cell is activated and it generates the bioelectric signal. So this is the active behavior of the membrane. I introduce to you this beautiful animal, the squid. Squid is essential experimental animal in these uh, experiments which I will discuss. And why? The reason is that it was very long time ago already observed that the squid has very thick axons. They are called giant axons. Here is a scale so that it's uh, even in the millimeter uh, uh, scale, the, the th thickness. The reason why squid, with uh, this kind of octopus animal squid, has so thick axon is that in the evolution it is on so low level that it has not yet uh, developed the myelin sheath on, on the axon, which means that uh, uh, the activation don't proceed so fast because there is not the uh, myelin sheath, the Schwann cells. And the way to increase the velocity is to increase the thickness of the axon. That makes it faster. The animal has to be fast, otherwise other, other animals will eat it or it is not able to catch some food for itself. So the speed is essential. So this is the reason why the squid has a very thick axon and because the axon is thick, it gives the possibility to do, mechanically do the, the, ex uh, uh, the experiments. And you see that here in this micrograph photograph, inside the axon, there is a metal microelectrode, which you will see later on in the schemas. So that is the reason why squid giant axons are used. Please do not mix, it is not question of giant squids. It is just a squid which has giant axons. So this is uh, just for to entertain you. Here is a giant squid which does not have anything to do with the work which I will introduce to you. So this is a huge animal, some maybe four meters long or so. So please don't mix to the giant squid. I teach you the voltage clamp method. Voltage clamp method is an essential experiment to do, uh, to study the behavior of the uh, membrane or the cells or the axons. What is a voltage clamp method? <coughs> the target of the voltage clamp method is to do selective measurement of sodium and potassium ion flows or ion currents during the activation. So separately measure these uh, 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 currents to be able to analyze the uh, activation, the mechanism. Here is an experiment where the uh, uh, which is just a, a, a uh, not a clamp experiment, uh, just a, a standard method where it is stimulated, stimulated the axon here. You see the stimulation pulse comes here and it is then uh, activation is proceeding in the axon in this way and here is measured the membrane voltage. Here is the model of the axon which I did show you uh, last time. 
So what is measured in this situation? It is measured the membrane current, which is uh, capacitive and ionic current, and the pros progress of the, the, the activation, so that it is so complicated equation which describes the situation. You don't see in this, in this situation separately what is the ionic current of sodium ions and uh, potassium ions. So let us proceed to make more simple situation. Okay, we still still show what is measured in in the in the previous case. Sorry, it is measured both axial currents, which is a propagating impulse, and radial currents, which are currents through the membrane, which include sodium current, potassium current, and capacitive current. So all those are measured in this situation. How to separate these? Let's proceed so that we first eliminate the axial current, the current which is proceeding along the axon. And for this purpose we use method called space clamp. In this method it is inserted an electrode inside the axon throughout the whole length of the axon. Made a stimulation, so and in this case, the whole axon is activating everywhere, throughout everywhere, at the same instant of time, because the stimulus is given throughout the axon. Which means that each instant of time, the potential is the same everywhere. So the membrane voltage at each instant of time is constant along the axon and therefore of course there is no current flowing in the axial direction along the axon because there is no potential difference. Now the equivalent circuit simplifies to here. There is no current flowing along the axon, only membrane current through the axon which is composed from ionic current and capacitive current. So we have made a little bit more simple this situation. So we measure only radial current which is composed from sodium current, potassium current and capacitive current. Next step. Let us eliminate the capacitive current with voltage clamp. Now I make a very simple question. When there is flowing no current through a capacitor? Sorry? Sorry, I, I, di I didn't... When it is already charged? Yeah. Well, that is... Uh, that may be the answer if you declare it more accurately. already charged to, to, to what uh, voltage? Well, the trick, the answer what I'm, I'm seeking is that when the voltage is constant over the capacitor, what you said is close to this, but when the voltage is constant, whichever the voltage is, but when it is constant, then after it is charged, as you said, but when it is constant, then there is no current flowing through the capacitor. So, let us make this ex uh, experiment so that we stimulate the axon in the way that we quickly switch on this uh, switch so that the voltage or the, or the potential at, the, uh, at the, the electrode or voltage over the membrane will be constant. Let us switch it like that, then at an instant, certain instant of time, the, sorry, the voltage on the electrode changes to the certain level, 
Then first, as you said, or what you mean, first there will be, of course, a current which is uh, charging the capacitor for a very short period of time, what you said. But th thereafter, thereafter, there is no capacitive current flowing after this uh, charging of the capacitor. And the current which is flowing now is only ionic current. And we may record this kind of current flow and the corresponding equivalent circuit is here. No capacitive current path, only ionic current. So what is flowing through the membrane is only ionic current. In this, this is the voltage clamp experiment. So we have proceeded so that axial currents were eliminated with the uh, space clamp principle, which is here. And radial currents, from radial currents, the capacitive current is eliminated and now is measured only sodium and potassium current. Next step is to separate the sodium and potassium current so that we, we see them separately and that may also be done with voltage clamp. Let us proceed. Okay, this is just to show how practically the voltage clamp circuit realistically looks like. I do not go too much to the details, but just the idea here is that there is special current for uh, electrode for feeding the current and another electrode for detecting the voltage. But th that's just practical measurement technology. Let us prepare the action for the experiment. When we have the axon here, it is first uh, uh, measured how it responds to the stimulus. Then it is uh, prepared for the experiment so that it is squeezed the axoplasm out from the axon like a toothpaste from the tube. Then it is filled with a perfusion fluid like that. And then it is again made the stimulation and it is recognized that even though what is, was done for the action was mechanically quite stressing and, and, uh, and, and uh, heavy, still the membrane responses electrically quite the same way. So it is allowed to do this kind of, of preparation and this preparation is needed to be able to insert the electrode inside the action. Let us do voltage clamp measurements to the axon and see how it behaves. Here is what I did show just before, is uh, potential inside the axon is suddenly changed from the resting potential to plus 20 millivolts. And the response what is measured, the current which is flowing through the membrane is first the artifact due to the capacitive current, when, when the capacitor is charged, it is very short. And this is the ionic current through the membrane. First goes inward current and then delayed outward current. That is the response of the activating axon in voltage clamp experiment. From this, it is a bit difficult to say anything more. But let's do a set of voltage clamp experiments. Then we may find something more interesting. First experiment to this voltage, second, third, fourth and fifth. So we change the inside potential to these different values and record this kind of current flowing through the membrane. And we find that when the clamp voltage is smaller, there is first an inward transient current and then slowly increasing delayed outward current. And when the clamp voltage is, uh, step is large, then the first transient is outwards and then continues the uh, slow increase. And at a certain clamp voltage level, this transient 
is zero. This is the interesting point. Is anyone from you brave enough to tell what happens here? Anyone wants to make any guess? No, it's not so very simple, but when I tell it to you, then you find that, well, that's how it goes. So there is a certain voltage where the first transient is neutralized. And when you go back to the previous material, which I did uh, teach to you, you find this is a bit confusing that these are potentials, not from a cat motor neuron, but these are from squid axon. So they are a little bit different values, but, but uh, order of magnitude is the same. You may find, when you go back, you may find that, aha, that is about the nearest voltage of sodium ions. So when the potential inside the axon is with the clamp technique, clamped to the level of the nearest voltage of the sodium ions, then the sodium ions are in equilibrium. And because the sodium ions are in equilibrium, they are not flowing through the membrane. If the potential inside is higher than the nearest voltage, then the sodium ions are flowing outwards. And if it is lower, then the sodium ions are flowing inwards. So it is clear, I think it is clear for you as well, that this first transient must be due to sodium ion flow because it is eliminated and it is zero at the potential, which is the nearest potential, nearest voltage of sodium ions. And what is following there is only potassium ion current. Now we have been able to separate at this certain level of uh, inside potential. The sodium and potassium ion current so that we eliminate the sodium current and we measure only potassium current. That is the trick. Sodium current is eliminated with proper cl clamp voltage. We measure only potassium current and when we want to know the potassium current with some other uh, voltage levels, then we just may change the uh, concentration of sodium so that it will, it will be uh, uh, in equilibrium in that level. I show it with this picture. Here is a resting membrane. This is the membrane inside, outside. The sodium ions have such a concentration ratio that uh, their nearest voltage is uh, plus 55 millivolts. They do not flow too much through the membrane because the membrane is uh, uh, not so permeable for sodium ions. And potassium ions uh, are closer, uh, the, the, the nearest voltage is here. So this is the, the uh, resting potential here with the dashed line. And what is done then? It is made the voltage clamp. The inside potential is quickly changed to plus 52 millivolts in, in the experiment. Now you see that the inside potential is quite the same as the nearest voltage for sodium ions, there is no gradient for sodium ions. Sodium ions do not flow through the membrane even though the channels will be open. Unlike the potassium ions, which do flow through the membrane because the gradient is so big and the potassium channels are open. So this is what happens in the experiment 
series of experiments which I did show you. And here is John Eccles, the same illustration which I did show originally his idea which I modified, who won the Nobel Prize as I mentioned. So voltage clamp measures only radial ionic currents, sodium and potassium ion currents. The sodium current is obtained by subtracting the potassium current from the radial ionic current. So here is uh, shown the same thing again, again and again. The voltage clamp experiment. Here it is the inside potential is switched to this level and therefore it is recorded this current during the activation because it activates it. And here is seen, uh, I don't go too much to the details, are seen the, the gradients for each uh, ions and the, the nerve voltages. Uh, it is possible uh, to uh, measure the potassium current uh, after changing sodium concentration to equilibrium in clamp voltage and then sodium current obtained by subtracting potassium current from the total current. So this is the sodium current in that situation. So that kind of manipulations is possible to do. There are also other possibilities during the voltage clamp experiment to separately measure the sodium and potassium ion currents, not only in the way that uh, the voltage clamp is made to that potential level where sodium is uh, in equilibrium. There are other methods also. And here is a method which I show you by using pharmaceutical agents. Here is first made a set of voltage clamp measurements, just those which I have shown you before. Then it is added tetrodotoxin to the uh, to the uh, uh, liquid and tetrodotoxin chemically blocks the sodium channels. Therefore, in this voltage series of voltage clamp experiments, only current which is flowing is potassium current. Then it is uh, taken the tetrodotoxin away a new control experiment showing the same result as first one and now is added tetraethyl ammonium which blocks the potassium channels so that only current which is flowing is sodium current that is one way tetrodotoxin is very very strong poison because it, uh, uh, because it blocks the sodium channels. Tetrodotoxin uh, exists in various animals in, in uh, various uh, concentrations. The famous animal having tetrodotoxin is fugufish. Are you familiar with fugufish? Who knows fugufish? Some, some of you. It is uh, in uh, in Japan, the Japanese people feel that it's, it's a great food. It's uh, tetrodotoxin exists in the liver of the fugu fish, and it's said that it is a thousand two times deadlier than cyanide. One fish may kill 30 people. The Japanese people like to eat the fugu fish. Uh, Japanese people always eat fu uh, uh, fish raw. And uh, the uh, liver is carefully uh, taken away from the animal, but there is some tetrodotoxin still in the, in, in the fish meat. And uh, it is said that it makes a fantastic feeling to the mouth and, and eating that it uh, uh, sounds strange, but that's, that's what, what uh, they like. And it has been very dangerous. I have some figures here. In 1950s, annually, 400 people died in Japan for eating fugu fish. That's a great number. 30,000 became sick. But then they had a very uh, strict law. Uh, they had licensed cooks and licensed restaurants 
which uh, we are preparing this food, so that in year 2007, only three people died for eating fugu fish. I have the information that eating fugu fish is not permitted to the Emperor Akihito because it is so risky. But you can see in Japan, in, in supermarkets, you can just find fugu fish uh, if you want to go uh, and, and buy it. I took this from, from internet. There is some, some uh, uh, Western lady eating, eating fugu fish with uh, her Japanese uh, hosts. I'm not sure whether she is still alive, but anyhow, that's, that's what they have made. In Tokyo, uh, some years ago, I was walking there. I found this restaurant in Tora Fuku in Asakusa. They have an aquarium here. The fugu fish are, are uh, swimming there. Uh, fugu is available, and there are the, the ads. So that about the, the fugu fish. I go next to Hodgkin-Huxley membrane model. It was uh, developed by Hodgkin and Huxley, uh, who were working in Cambridge, and uh, they received a Nobel Prize with Eccles in 1963 for study of the transmission of nerve impulses along a nerve fiber. So what I'm going to tell you now is a Nobel Prize work. What is the Hodgkin-Huxley model? It is a theory which explains the behavior of the membrane during the activation, how it develops the activation. It is a fundamental work, seminal work. And I will show you a bit later on how well it holds with reality. Some scientists or quite many scientists have wanted to improve the Hodgkin-Huxley model and call the new model with their own name and claim that it is better than Hodgkin-Huxley model. Well, maybe, maybe not. Hodgkin and Huxley made the basic fundamental work. And that's what I'm going to tell you to explain what is the process of the activation in membrane. Here are the same colleagues a little bit later, Agles, Hodgkin and Huxley. All of them are already deceased. And we have again our good friend Squid in these experiments, just because it has a giant axon. You may have seen this picture in, in uh, books describing uh, the behavior of membrane, and I did show you this uh, earlier. Many people think that this is the Hodgkin-Huxley model. No, this is not. This is the parallel uh, model, a parallel uh, uh, model of, of the parallel conductance model of the membrane, showing that fundamentally the membrane current is uh, composed from capacitive current, sodium current, potassium current, and leakage current, which is mainly chloride. And here are the corresponding conductances and the nearest voltages. So this parallel conductance model, this was already uh, introduced by, uh, if um, I, should, I should check it, who was introduced, I, I think it was Young, but I, I'm, I'm not, not quite sure, I should find it. it it's, this is much late, much earlier uh, introduced than the work of Hodgkin and Huxley. From this equation or model, you can easily write equations for sodium conductance is sodium current over the voltage over the conductance, the same for the uh, potassium conductance and leakage conductance. So just basic equations of, 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 of uh, uh, theory of electricity. You can also easily calculate the corresponding sodium, uh, potassium and chloride. Uh, nearest voltages with these equations which you already know. 
and for whole the circuit you can write this equation. No problem to do this. What Hodgkin and Huxley made? They developed a theory to explain how these conductances behave during the activation. So these conductances, how they do behave during the activation. That is the Hodgkin-Huxley model. And I tell you that these conductances depend on two factors. And the factors are time and the voltage over the conductance. And Hodgkin and Huxley explained how they do behave. That is the Hodgkin and Huxley model, not this circuit. Let us do series of voltage clamp experiments to measure potassium conductance. We do stimulate the axon and have these uh, clamp voltages and get this kind of potassium conductances. And Hodgkin and Huxley described how these behave. This is kind of historical picture. When I started to lecture bioelectromagnetism long, 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 long time ago, I just made, tried to make clear for myself what Hodgkin and Huxley had in mind, and I draw for myself this kind of, this kind of draft for the Hodgkin-Huxley model already in the, in the uh, early 1980s. So it is historical and very uh, exciting for myself personally. But uh, here it is shown more clearly. I tell you first that what Hodgkin and Huxley in their publication uh, gave their equations to describe the behavior of the sodium and potassium conductances. They did not actually give a physical or anatomical model for that. But they briefly said that, for instance, the following kind of model obeys or follows their equations. And then they gave the, the, the uh, explained the model, but with no illustration. I did sit down and uh, made this draft, how the model could look like, what Hodgkin and Huxley uh, explained, and draw this uh, later on in more detail. And then I sent a letter to Hodgkin and Huxley to Cambridge and said that I'm interested in, in your model and I made this kind of uh, uh, illustration of the model. What, what do you think about that? And uh, Hodg Hodgkin was already uh, a bit uh, paralyzed, but Huxley was in very good physical condition and, and he responded on behalf of the, both of them and said that that's, that's great, that's, that's fine, they like it very much. But there are some small changes and improvements what they would like to do for my drawings and made the suggestions. And I was very happy that they had some uh, suggestions because if they had only said that, yes, it is fine, it had meant that they had not read my, my letter at all. But when they had some comments, it was an indication that they were interested in that. So I show now here uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley explanation with the illustration which I have drawn. And I say to you that Hodgkin and Huxley did not claim that this is physically what happens in the cell membrane, but for instance, this kind of process, if it were in the cell membrane, follows their equations. But hopefully this explains a little bit what, is, what they had in mind. So, let us first observe or explain the behavior of the potassium conductors. According to Hodgkin and Huxley, in the membrane, there are the channels for potassium ions. The channels are first closed. 
Inside the membrane potential is negative, you see from the blue color, and outside positive, you see from the red color. Now is made the voltage clamp, like that. Inside is made positive compared to outside. Here are at the channel electrically charged particles of type N, which may be either in opening position, meaning that they open the channel, or non-opening position, meaning that being there they do not open the channel. And so-called transfer rate coefficients, alphas and betas, explain how these particles are moving between these positions. Alphas and betas are functions of membrane voltage because these particles are charged. Now, after the voltage clamp, you see that alpha has become larger than beta. I go back. Uh, so it comes alpha becomes larger than beta, which means that the particles start to move from non-opening position to opening position. It is not sufficient that there is one particle here in the opening position, like here. The channel will not open. It is not sufficient that there are two particles either. Now you see that there's a third particle moving. That's not sufficient either. But when there are four particles, then the channel will open. And it allows the sodium ions to flow from the higher concentration to the lower concentration, from in to out, another ion is flowing. And the same goes on on the other channel. The particles are moving here. Two is not sufficient. Three is not enough. But when having four particles of type N, channel opens and ions may flow from inside to outside. That is how the channel opens. The alphas and betas are functions of membrane voltage. I do not go in detail to these. You find them from the book, sure. I, I just skip a little bit to make uh, make not so, so uh, heavy and difficult uh, this material. And the same is shown here at first time, second time instant, what I did show. And so, and finally, You see that during the clamp voltage depolarization, alpha is large and beta is small, and after repolarization, they just switch. So. so, during the time when alpha is large, there is a probability N for a particle type N to move to an opening position. This is just an exponential curve, this probability to go there. But because one particle is not sufficient, it is needed four particles. We need the probability curve of n to the fourth power, and it is this curve. And the potassium conductance is proportional to this fourth power of the probability of n. And I take just uh, the potassium conductance uh, uh, set of curves over here, and you find that on a certain membrane, the voltage clamp, it is just exactly following the mathematical model. That is how the behavior goes. I go to the sodium conductance. This is one step more difficult, because when the sodium conductance is recorded on the voltage clamp, you find that it first increases and then it actively decreases. So there must be two mechanisms uh, controlling the sodium conductance, an active opening mechanism of the channels and active closing mechanism of the channels. In potassium ions, there was only an active opening mechanism. And this is the situation. 
Sodium ions have a higher concentration outside the cell. Concentration gradient is from out to in. Channels, sodium channels are closed. Let us do the voltage clamp. Potentials change. There are particles of type M which control the opening of the channel. They are in the non-opening position, but because, because of the clamp, voltage clamp, this transfer rate coefficient alpha, which shows the probability of the particles to move to the opening position, is increasing, and they start to move. One particle in the opening position is not sufficient. Here is another going here. Two particles is not sufficient. But when three particles are in the opening position, the channel opens and sodium ions may flow through. Here the same, three particles, channel opens, sodium ions flow through. So this opening me mechanism is similar as in potassium ions, but the number of particles needed to open the channel is not four, but three. What happens then? There do exist also type H particles, which actively close the channel. When the type H particle moves here, one particle is enough to close the channel. And the same here. So, so there are two mechanisms. And the alphas and betas for for type M particles move as a function of voltage and same for H, I skip this and uh, I, I go here to next. So the probability of the particle M to move to the opening position follows this curve. That is not the curve what the opening uh, follows. It is the third power of this, because it is needed three particles. And then there is an active closing process of the particle H, which is shown upside down because it is closed. And the sodium conductance is proportional to the m to the third power times H, which is shown here. And this is the sodium conductance. That is a bit complicated, I agree. And what is unfortunate is that exactly that mechanism don't physically exist in the cell. They made a speculation long, long time ago, speculation, and they didn't even claim that that is the mechanism. But let's have a look, for instance, if we have in the ionic channel four molecules here, in this way, which they close the channel. Uh, think that the ionic channel is now uh, normal to the screen. This is a potassium ion channel and these molecules prevent the potassium ion to flow through the channel. Now if one of these ions is rotating like this, channel is not open, when two rotating not enough, four rotating not enough, but when all the four molecules are rotating, then the channel opens and the potassium ion may flow through. So if we replace the, uh, the transfer of the particles from outside membrane to inside the membrane with their rotation, which follows the same equation, then we come to this kind of physically uh, realistic model. And there is some evidence that this kind of ionic channels do exist. This is the kind of picture which you find in modern uh, cell membrane uh, publications and uh, that is just the same but that this is behavior is explained with the uh, hodgkin huxley model. So that was the physical modeling of the ionic channel behavior and now I go to the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, which is the real output of Hodgkin and Huxley. So the transmembrane current is, as I did show you before, membrane current is composed from capacitive current, 
sodium current, potassium current, and leakage current. And the sodium and potassium conductances are functions of time and voltage over them. And that is explained with the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, which are here. Maximum conductance is proportional to m to the third power time h. Maximum potassium conductance is proportional to m to the fourth power. And leakage conductance is constant. And m's, m, h and n are obtained from these equations, which I did skip. These transfer coefficients, alphas and betas, are numerically given here with these equations. And these are the constants uh, in, 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 in the equations. So these are the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And when developing and solving these equations, they received the Nobel Prize. That's the story. I show you now in more detail with this graph how the sodium and potassium conductances behave during the activation. I did show you a, a, a schematic picture of the, of the, the uh, cardiac cell just in the beginning of the course, but here it is a bit more detailed. Activation is proceeding in the axon, and uh, when the activation is approaching this uh, uh, observation point, the potential is increasing during the adjacent activation, and when the potential membrane potential change reaches the threshold, then the process starts. Then the process, which I did explain just now, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, it starts and the sodium and potassium conductances start to change. I told you first that uh, first opens the sodium channels and then later on open the potassium channels. Uh, that is true or not true, depending how you think it. When you look here, you see that both sodium and potassium conductances, sodium is this uh, yellow, potassium is this green, both of them start to increase at the same instant of time, but the sodium conductance increases faster than the potassium. So in that way, it is, yes, it is possible to say that first open the sodium channels and then open the potassium channels. See what happens. Sodium ion channels open and therefore sodium ions flow inwards, bringing positive charge inside the membrane and the membrane inside potential is increasing, increasing higher and higher. The upper limit where it theoretically may go is the nursed voltage of sodium ions, but it doesn't go so high. Then sodium conductance decreases quite quickly. Sodium current inwards stops. Potassium conductance is increasing slowly, permitting potassium ions to flow from in to out, taking a positive charge from in to out, taking back the membrane inside potential to, towards the resting potential. Actually, it goes over this. This is the theoretical maximum, is the nursed potential for potassium ions. It does not go just there, but goes here below the uh, resting potential and is quite slowly returning back to the resting potential. So this overshooting here, that is called positive after potential. And why it is called positive after potential, it is therefore that it is negative. Well, this confusing situation comes from there that earlier times, the polarities of these uh, phenomena were understood in opposite way. Actually, Hodgkin and Huxley still used that old polarity. And when I discussed with Hodg Hodgkin, he said that he, they are very sorry that they used that old polarity in their publication. Uh, it was just changing at those times. 
it does not decrease the value of their work at all, but it uh, makes a bit confusing. In my book, you find that I have changed the polarity in the Hodgkin-Huxley theory to the modern way, and Hodgkin and Huxley were happy for that also. So this is how the sodium and potassium conductances change during the activation and how they affect to the membrane potential changes. Here is also the same issue a bit different way. Membrane voltage is changing in the propagation nerve impulse like this. Sodium conductance changing like that. Potassium conductance like that. And total membrane current follows this curve. Capacitive current this one and ionic current this one. And you see that at the instant of time when membrane potential change is zero, the derivative is zero, then of course the capacitive current is zero. That's an example. And the membrane current is only ionic current. I go to explain to you the properties of Hodgkin and Huxley model. Hodgkin and Huxley verified their model by uh, doing measurements in different situations for the membrane voltage and calculating with their model the same situation and comparing that. Here's non-propagating nerve impulse, just a copy of their publication. Let's put them over. You find that the calculated and measured voltages very closely fit. Here is the membrane voltage and non-propagating, measured and calculated and measured, very good fitting. Here is uh, propagating nerve impulse, okay, and response during refract refractory period. These experiments, there are several of those. Here is another break. I just tell you what it means. It means that if we move, change the potential inside the membrane to the threshold voltage, the activation starts. But it is also possible to initiate the activation by hyperpolarizing the membrane, taking it very much more negative and suddenly releasing it. Then it may also activate, and that is so-called anode break. And even in that kind of experiments, the fitting is surprisingly good. I organized the Nordic Baltic Conference on Biomedical Engineering in 1996 in, in Tampere. Uh, before that I visited uh, Cambridge, I visited Hodgkin and Huxley, and, and I very much wanted to get Huxley to give an, uh, an opening uh, presentation or an invited presentation on how they developed their equations, but he, he didn't want to come anymore. He had been in Finland some years earlier in the World Congress of Physiology. But anyhow, as I said to Hodgkin and Huxley that I'm very much surprised how they were able to get numerically so accurate values for their models when thinking what kind of instrumentation they had in 1950s. They did not have uh, uh, semiconductor amplifiers in their voltage measurement systems. They did not have computers. They had just a mechanical uh, uh, multiplying uh, equipment and lots of paper and pencil and, and, and eraser. Just hunt our bite. It's surprising how accurate work they were able to do. So, in addition to the theoretical model, just the practical num numbers in the measurements and calculations, surprisingly good. So I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get him to Finland, but anyhow, I highly appreciate their work. I tell you the next uh, self-physiological experiment method which is more modern, which is called patch clamp method. Do you know what is patch? 
I don't know what it is in German. I should have checked it with a dictionary. I have a dic dictionary on the computer, but you may tell me what is patch. Uh, I show you a picture in a moment. The patch clamp method was developed by Erwin Neher and Bert Sackmann, who received the Nobel Prize in 91. So they are novelists and novelists in, in, in this course. Uh, Erwin Neher visited my institute in Tampere in 98, looking some some of our work. And here is a table of the winners of the Nobel Prizes in medicine. And Erwin Neher is uh, just looking, trying to find his face there, and he found it. So what is the patch clamp method? The patch clamp method is a, a method to record the ionic current through a single ionic channel on the membrane. A single one channel. That is a fantastic technology. And how the current behaves, which is flowing through a the channel. It behaves, I would say, digitally. The channel is either fully closed or fully open. There is no intermediate uh, value like in, in the water faucet in, 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 uh, where you take water more or less uh, from, the, uh, from the tube. Only thing which is changing is the length of these times when it is closed or open. So this is a patch kilt. Patch is uh, uh, like piece of fabric is, is, a, is a patch. What is that? What is that? Deutsch? Fleck. Fleck is, is that a piece of, of dye in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the fabric? Yeah. So, so it is a, okay. It's a piece of, piece of, uh, of fabric which you can take. That is a patch. I, I, I should find the, uh, what is that in, in in, in German. But anyhow, small piece of membrane is a patch. That's, that's the trick. In patch clamp, it is, uh, here is a cell. Then there is a glass micropipette or glass microelectrode. I show you a bit more. It is a very, very, very thin capillary tube from glass which is placed on the surface of the membrane and with a hyperpressure it is sucked a patch, small piece of the membrane into a micropipette and you see there is only one single ionic channel and it is measured the current through the single ionic channel. Here is shown a glass microelectrode. It is made so that there is, it is a thin glass tube which is heated. There is a, a, a metal resistance wire around that and it is heated from the center. And when it is melting, it is quickly pulled so that it stretches and finally uh, cuts. And uh, it takes this kind of form. There is a very, very thin and sharp capillary tube at the tip and here is shown scanning electron micrograph of two uh, micro pipette tips that is 2.6 micrometers that is 0.5 micrometers very 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 thin here are shown some instruments some older one and newer ones here i think this is clear here is a glass tube and here is a uh, a wire, metal wire going around, current is fed into the wire and it is heating the capillary tube and at a certain instant of time it is quickly pulled and it forms the capillary tube. That is the technology. The, on the right hand side is a more modern version. I show you now the patch clamp method. Here is a cell membrane. A micropipette is placed on the surface of the cell membrane in order to measure the current through a single ionic channel. The opening of the micropipette is of the order of one micrometer. Even though the micropipette is pressed towards the cell membrane, 
the seal is not fully insulating, there is a leakage of about 50 mega ohms. And 50 mega ohms in these cases is a very, very low value, very low resistance. There will be leaking current here in addition to the current through the single ionic channel so that what is measured is measured more the leakage current than the real membrane current through the ionic channel. 50 mega ohms in this case is a small, small impedance. So what is done? It is sucked with the suction, with the hyperpressure in the micropipette that the cell membrane, as I did show you, goes in this way inside the micropipette. And now the seal has an impedance of 10 to 100 giga ohms. So three orders of magnitude higher, which is sufficient. And this was the real invention of Neher and Sackman. Neher told, told me when visiting in Finland that it was actually by chance how they found what shall be chemically done to get the seal. So uh, high impedance. There were other groups also working with this problem, but they had good luck and they succeeded. That's it's, uh, it's often, uh, quite, quite often in science, that it is just a good luck. Good luck which makes the experiment to, to succeed. But the good luck doesn't come alone. You need to work very hard to get the opportunity for the good luck to come. So they had the good luck. It doesn't make their uh, achievements any less valuable. They are high valuable uh, uh, achievement, but that's the way how it goes. He was very honest to tell how it, how it went. And I, I, I fully agree that that's the way how science is made. Okay, from this situation, which is called cell attached recording, we can proceed in two ways. It may be continued, the hyperpressure, the sucking, so that it breaks the membrane even though it leaves here, but it breaks the membrane. And this technology may be used in measuring the potentials inside very small cells, like red blood cells or so. Think that if the cell is so small, 50, 5 to 20 micrometers, it is impossible to insert an electrode inside it. No, no, it's not possible. But in this way, we get a direct path from the electrode to the inverts or the inside of the cell. This is called whole cell recording. From this uh, step, it's possible to proceed so that the micropipette is further pulled up and finally the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, stretches and makes this kind of bridge, and finally it collapses. And it uh, joins together again. It is so flexible material. This is called outside-out patch. I tell you in a minute why, what, what's the idea here. It is possible to proceed in the first step in this way, not breaking the patch, but pulling the micropipette, and it uh, collapses here, the membrane, and then it is uh, uh, taken away, this, this part of membrane, uh, either with some chemical or, or uh, taking it in air exposure, so that finally there is an inside-out patch. In both of these cases, we have a small patch at the tip of the micropipette. In one case, the outside of the membrane is outwards. In the other case, the inside of the membrane is outwards. What's the trick here? The idea is that it is possible to change the concentration of the solution, which is here outwards, to study what is the effect of the concentration changes of certain pharmaceutical agents to the outside of the membrane, and here in this case to the inside of the membrane. 
because in the micropipette which is filled by, by saline, maybe I forgot to say that there is a liquid inside the micropipette which is a conducting electric current, here it is not possible to change the chemical content of, of, of that region because it is so thin and long the micropipette. It is possible to change only on the outside. So that is the reason for the outside out and inside out patch. And this technology is used very much in the pharmaceutical industry to find how various chemical agents and medicines affect to the behavior of the membrane. But we go to the, uh, to the membrane current measurements. This is a current through a single ion channel. I did show you this before. The current uh, amplitude is magnitude is about a few picoamps, very, very small current through a single ionic channel. And it is either closed or open, no intermediate value, but the time when it is open or closed, that is changing. Here is one picture which I show you, therefore, that I don't like this picture. This is from a famous book of Hille. He made a couple of, of wrote a couple of books. He's a good, famous scientist. And then there were not so good understanding about the ionic channels. And he did draw this kind of illustration, beautifully various anatomical parts of the cell membrane. And the opening and closing of the channel happens with this kind of gate, which you may easily understand that such cannot exist in the cell membrane. So this is nonsense. Let us do voltage clamp experiments for a single ionic channel. We do it several times to the same membrane voltage and record the current through the channel and find that it is channel is closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, and so on. This is a potassium channel. So this potassium channel don't behave at all in the way as Hodgkin and Huxley explained. No. Let's do another experiment. Now we get this kind of recording. Nothing to do with Hodgkin and Huxley. What's wrong? We do several measurements and get various recordings from the single channel. None of those look like the behavior of the potassium channel in the Hodgkin-Huxley model. What do we do next? Let us do an average of these recordings. Voila. We get this kind of recording. So, this is just what you remember from the behavior of sodium current flowing through the membrane during the voltage clamp. So what's wrong here? Or what's the idea? The idea is that a single ionic channel, it is either fully open or fully closed. But the probability of the channel to be open or closed follows this curve. That is a probability curve. So, when having a measurement, making a measurement of a single potassium ion channel, you do not see the grand behavior of the channel. You, in the single measurement, you, you see one probability uh, case. The behavior of the real behavior of the channel, you see by taking average of large number of measurements, which show it like this. In the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, experiment, we had a large amount of channels behaving simultaneously, and their probability to be open and close altogether is the same. So if we have one channel and make several measurements, or several channels and make one measurement, the result is the same. So this is, this is quite fascinating that a single channel is, I would like to say it is digitally, either open or closed, but the probability to be open follows the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And the same measurement result we get if we have one measurement for large number of channels which we have in the one axon.
And similar also for the sodium channels. Sodium channel measurements and then an average, you see that it is just like Hodgkin Huxley uh, explained. And again, one Nobel Prize divided by two scientists, Peter Ager and Roderick McKinnon. He, they continued about the membrane studies, discoveries concerning channels in cell membranes. I do not discuss their work here, but anyhow, from this topic, again, one Nobel Prize. So that was the story of uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, the theory behind the behavior of the cell membranes when they generate the bioelectric signal, the behavior of sodium and potassium ion uh, conductivities uh, to produce the bioelectric signal. And Hodgkin-Huxley model was a theoretical model and it is very well explaining how the uh, ionic channels open and close and behave. That was the story. I have some 10 minutes time. I go to chapter 5, synapses, receptor cells and brain. There do exist in the body various types of receptor cells, sensors we can say. Extra receptors, intra receptors, proprioceptors, which examples are photoreceptors, chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors. Inside the body are chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors in the ear, osmoreceptors in hypothalamus and so on, and proprioceptors telling uh, how the muscles are stretching and so on. I go to the synapse. I briefly told you about the synapse, synapse already before, and I mentioned that Sherrington and Adrian received the Nobel Prize from their work on this study. Synapse is a presynaptic terminal here, it's the end of the axon. Postsynaptic terminal here, it is a dendrite or soma of the next cell. And when activation proceeds along the uh, axon, when it reaches a presynaptic terminal, it makes these vesicles, which include neurotransmitter molecules, to physically move towards this synaptic cleft, the uh, intermittent region, and release the chemical agent here, which flows to the uh, channels of the postsynaptic membrane, opening them. There do exist excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Excitatory synapse means that activation there generates uh, excitation in the next cell and inhibitory of course prevents the excitation to happen. <coughs> Let's see what happens here. This region of the cell, the nerve cell is magnified. Here is the axon of the previous cell coming. This is a uh, synaptic uh, region and when there is activation coming uh, then transmitter molecules are released to this postsynaptic terminal and they open the sodium ion channels and sodium current is flowing here. As a result here is changing the positive charge is accumulating here in the axon hillock which is the root of the axon and makes it activate. If we record with the microelectrode what's happening here, one activation generates here an excitatory postsynaptic potential EPSP, which don't, it is not sufficient to move or change the resting potential up to the level of threshold and activation does not yet start. Inhibitory synapse, it is other way around. Activation comes here and releases transmitter molecules which open the chloride channels and electric current flows here in the opposite direction. And by microelectrode we may record inhibitory postsynaptic potential IPSP here.
you saw that one single activation in the one single synapse is not sufficient to generate activation in the axon hillock. It is needed some summation. Summation may be either spatial region or temporal, which means time. I show you first spatial summation. Single activating synapse generates current and it is recorded EPSP not sufficient to reach threshold. In other synapse the same third and fourth. None of those is sufficient. If two of those activate at the same time we get a signal uh, EPSP which is one plus two is larger not sufficient. Three of those is sufficient generating so high EPSP that membrane potential reaches the threshold and generates in axon hillock the activation. This is special summation. Temporal summation is that we have one synapse here, one EPSP not sufficient, two activations one after another, no difference. If the two activations are very close to each other in time. Then the second one is a bit higher already, starting not from zero. If they're still closer to each other, almost reaches the threshold. And if they are very close, close to each other, then the potential change reaches the threshold and activation is generated. That is temporal summation. So which one you have? Do you have spatial or temporal summation? Which one you have? Which one you want to have in your brain? Well, the answer is that you have both of them mixed and it's uh, in, in, in your brain. It is, cannot be separated. It is so complicated. This is just theory. Here are some beautiful pictures of those, those uh, neur neuromuscular uh, junctions. That is magnified here and that region is magnified here. Well, you find these from the physiology books, I do not spend too much time showing, showing these. Here's the electric model of the postsynaptic cell. Here is the voltage-dependent channels which respond for impulse inside. And here is the excitatory synaptic channel. So this is excitatory synapse. This is a model. What happens when the acetylcholine the, reaches the cell? It opens both sodium and potassium channels and those currents will flow. Inhibitory synapse, here is a membrane and uh, it opens the chloride channels and extra current is flowing making the inhibitory effect. So I take this uh, summary of uh, membrane activation and synaptic voltages. Here is a membrane region and that is a synaptic region. This is a synapse. Early effect in membrane region is just depolarization to reach the threshold. In synaptic region is arrival of acetylcholine. Changes in membrane conductance during rising phase in membrane region is specific increases of sodium ion conductance. In synaptic region, both of them increase. In the falling phase, specific, specific increase of potassium conductance in the membrane region and in synaptic region, just passive decay of both of those. Equilibrium voltage of active membrane is the sodium ion nurse voltage. And in synaptic region, it is the reversa voltage, which is quite close to zero. Other features, regenerative ascent followed by refractive period. Refractive period is the, the, the hyperpolarization when it is more difficult to generate the, to reach the threshold and no evidence of regenerative action or refractoriness in synaptic region. Pharmacology, membrane region, the activation is blocked by tetrodotoxin, but not influenced by curare. And in synaptic region, it is blocked by curare, not influenced by tetrodotoxin. I told you what is tetrodotoxin. It is in the fugu fish, but what is curare? Who knows what is curare? You know. And w for what it is used? Um, 
yeah, there you are on the right way. So, uh, Fuku fish I told you already, but curare is a poison obtained from this kind of uh, plant, the Strychnostoxifera, uh, and uh, it is uh, used by South American Indians. They they have a small darts which they are uh, with a long blowing tube. They are blowing to the to the animal, and when the animal is reached with the dart, where the tip of the dart has curare, it paralyzes the animal, and they can catch the animal. Here is another picture of the blowgun and blowpipe. So the curare is is a poison used by the South American Indians, but it is today very effective. A pharmaceutical agent, a medicine which is used, for instance, in surgical operations, because it paralyzes the patient. When taking, making a large uh, surgical operations uh, wherever in, in the legs or in the stomach or so, of course, first is uh, uh, for the patient is given anesthetic which takes off the pain, and then it is taken the, the consciousness of the patient so that it is not nice to know that the surgeons are, are inside your toma stomach. It is better that the, that the patient is sleeping. And thirdly, it is relaxed the muscles of the patients because it is impossible, for instance, to do two surgical operations in, in, in legs because the muscles, anyhow, even though the patient is not uh, 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 contracting them, they are in contraction and it is very difficult to operate unless they are uh, relax it, and curare is used for that purpose. And then I think it is quarter to twelve, and it may be best to stop story here, and we continue after one week. Thank you very much. <laughs>